Okay. Well done. Yay. Thanks for that. Getting going. Perseverance. Yeah. Actually, that's the motto of the Strathcona, so we won't talk about it. <laughs> Ours is tenacious and versatile. A very good title for the Grand Simcoe's, as you'll learn tonight in this, our crazy history that's un unlike any other regiment in the Canadian Army. This is the badge that we currently wear. And the thing to remember, as you'll see, is that the Greys and the Simcoe's used to be two separate regiments. And their amalgamation was 80 years ago, in 1936, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And uh, when they amalgamated, they decided to use the badge of the sister regiment, the Sherwood Foresters. The Simcoe's and the Sherwoods already were connected since 1931. King George V approved the, the alliance. The Sovereign has to approve the alliance between regiments. So it was George V back then, and he approved the uh, liaison between, uh, the affiliation between the two regiments. So the Simcoe, Grace and Simcoe's took the Sherwood Forester badge and Canadianized it. So the Brits called it a heart. It's a little deer in England. We don't have little deers over here. We have stags. So that's a stag in Canada. <laughs> on the British one, it says Sherwood Foresters across there. And on the bottom, it says Knotts and Derby, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire which by sheer coincidence is where the fishers are from. And we took the laurel leaves off the British one and replaced them with Canadian autumn leaves. So that's the badge as approved by Her Majesty, of the, as it is now, of the Grey Simple Forester. So it's a proper Maltese cross with uh, the two scrolls, the Demi scroll and the main scroll, saying Grey Simple Foresters. So this is our sesquicentennial. We were gazetted officially on the 14th of September, 19, sorry, 1866. Notice that's before Confederation, the year before Confederation. But the roots are much older. As mentioned, 1936, they were amalgamated. And that was done in a special dinner in Stainer at the Legion. So we're going to reenact that in a few weeks. On the 14th of December, which is the actual date, we were working on setting up a dinner in the Stainer Legion to uh, do it again. And we'll talk about some background and the events we did this year. So we're a larger unit of CFP Borden. We have garrisons in Barrie and Owen Sound. So for support, we get support from CFP Borden. We're their only infantry regiment that they support. And we're also the founding battalion, or perpetuate the founding battalion of Borden, which is the 157 Simcoe's. An A company of the, of the 157th was here in Collingwood. Okay, and as mentioned, we're one of, one of six infantry regiments in 31 Canadian Brigade Group, headquartered in London, and it is one of four brigades of the 4th Canadian Division. <coughs> so there's the Barry Armory, as it is uh, when it was new, and it hasn't changed much. It's one beautiful building. It's 100 years old this year. And there's the Owen Sound Armory built in the 50s, which is a piece of junk and falling down, but that's all we can do. It just shows the difference in quality. The one in Barrie was built to the standard of the, the great fortresses of the armories in the early part of the 20th century that you'll see in Ontario and uh, the northern U.S. And there are several different names for it. It's now a historic building. So put another way, the Canadian Army is comprised of five divisions. The 4th is headquartered in Toronto. It has four brigades, two brigade in Petawawa, 31 brigade out of London, 32 brigade out of Toronto, and 33 out of Ottawa. So this badge with the arrowhead, that is 31 brigade. So you see a soldier wearing 4 div and 31 brigade, you know, the, the regiment or the unit they're headquartered with is, is out of uh, London. Out of. How many men in the brigade? Uh, in wartime, there's about 5,000, and right now, in uh, we probably got about 1,500 in peacetime in 3100 feet. There's 12 units, because there's also armored and support and artillery and all the other parts of the brigade, but in that, there's six of them that are infantry. Okay, so we provide full and part-time employment for approximately 240 people, that's our peacetime strength. 
We also run a grade 12 co-op program with four boards of education. So one of those is running right now in a gray county with the Blue Water, so uh, Gray Bruce. So th those students are full-time in the Owen Sound Armory, learning to be soldiers, and also getting four grade 12 credits. And occasionally we run it also with Simcoe County Board of Education. We also sponsor two Army Cadet Corps, one in Barrie and one in Old Sound. And we support two Air Cadet Squadrons and one Sea Cadet Corps. Our present role is to provide combat capable infantry regiment on the reserve order of battle ready to deploy or augment the regular force. And uh, nothing's more recent than that than Afghanistan. And uh, the foresters were right in the very front fighting the Taliban. And some of my young soldiers that had been Army cadets, then in the co-op program, I swore them in, and a year later, they are in the very front lines fighting the Taliban in Abu Medusa, probably the biggest fight we had in 2006 in Afghanistan. So some of these guys, I, I know them since they were little guys, and they, they, some of them came back pretty uh, beaten up from that experience. Uh, and then our present thing is the Arctic Response Company group. And we usually are gone February to March in uh, the North and the High Arctic. So this past year, as I mentioned, 2016, we were in the Subarctic initially, so James Bay, Western Hudson's Bay, and then in the High Arctic in Resolute Bay on Cornwallis Island. And we're going back there again this winter, coming up. So there's the Canadian Arctic. It's huge. You can drop the whole of Europe in it with room to spare. Baffin Island, which is right here, is four times the size of the UK and has three settlements on it. That's how big it is. Yeah, that gives you a better idea. So Cornwallis Island in Resolute Bay is right here. Dodd is Resolute Bay. The only way in is by air. So, most recently, we were awarded the Battle Honor for Afghanistan. It's the first Battle Honor we've received since the end of the First World War. And there's a reason for that, and we're still fighting World War II. I haven't given up on that yet. Okay, and I've already beat that to death. And that. Okay. This will give you a little idea of the contrast of the environments. So this is Corporal Tyler Boffman. He was a student at Georgian College. He's in Afghanistan. <coughs> oh, thank you. These are the things you knock airplanes out of the sky with. <laughs> so there's Tyler when he was in Afghanistan. Here's the guys on an impromptu machine gun range up at Rankin Inlet, which is the very northwest <coughs> corner of Hudson's Bay before you go into the Arctic Ocean. And it's probably about at least minus 50 in that photo, <coughs> at least. Alert. Yes. Yeah. Next stop is Santa Claus, as I was from alert. And here are, the, here are the, the troops making friends with the locals. And I think this is in uh, Rankin Inlet or Chesterfield Cove, one or the other. I think it's Rankin Inlet. Okay, there's just some uh, temperatures from when we were there in 2014. They're sleeping on the sea ice. So that's water underneath them, all the way to the bottom. So. The other funny thing about working in the north, we've gone back to carrying the rifles we carried in World War II. We're back to carrying 303 Lee Enfields. Any idea why? They work. They work. They work. Yeah. And you know why? 7.65 won't stop the polar bear. Yep, that's it. We're at the top of the menu. There's those big furry white things. So. We are, the, the food chain is not stopped with us. We're actually on the menu in the north, so we, we carry uh, the rifles because of the, uh, the bears. Okay, that's the group in uh, 2014 up at uh, Rankin Inlet. Okay, let's look back. So the Fenian raids were the founding point in 1866. Okay, the darn Americans, right? Three times they attacked Canada. They, they don't even believe it, but they did. So this, this time, of course, it's the uh, disgruntled uh, Irish Republican Army folks that were uh, in the American Civil War. So that's the catalyst to 
gazette the independent rifle and the infantry companies in the communities into proper battalions. Then in 1885, Colonel O'Brien from Shanty Bay, just east of Barrie, he took the York Simcoe Battalion west for the uh, Re Northwest Rebellion, and we got our first battle honor there. And then in uh, the latter part there, between Queen Victoria and Edward uh, VII, we have the South African War. And we just discovered the other day, we thought we only had one killed in action, that was James Finley. We found another one out of Owen Sound, and then we just found an, a third one. So there's uh, three now that we know of, of our ranks that were killed in action in South Africa. So the history is still unfolding. First World War, I'll get back to lest we forget, because we have forgotten, and that was one of the major projects this year. And Second World War, the Korean War, which is just volunteers, those that decided to go over with uh, 25 brigade. Northwest Rebellion. This very famous photo you see of the Northwest Rebellion going through one of the, this is the Humboldt Creek in Saskatchewan. See the person on the white horse there? That's Colonel O'Brien. That's our own Colonel O'Brien. And this is the 35th Simcoe's and the Yorks which is now the Queen's York Rangers out of Aurora, heading out west. Incredible story, all I could spend all night talking about that. How they got out there, uh, going across Lake Superior on the ice, wearing the same uniforms that the cadets at RMC wore, the Scarlets. That was their battle dress. Anyway, we'd all be crying, I don't know how they did it. They all got out there, didn't lose a person, all got back. World War I shows an incredible contribution from the, the citizens of both counties. So initially, when the war breaks out in 1914, people from the 31st Grey Regiment and the 35th Simcoe Foresters go off and join up into the Canadian Expeditionary Force. But by 1915, both counties get the call to create their own, raise their own battalions. So Grey raises the 147th, Simcoe initially raises the 157th, and there's so many that want to join the 157th, it spills over, and Simcoe is given a 2nd Battalion. They were known locally as the 1st and 2nd Simcoe's. They're the ones that Bill Borden, especially the 157th. Later, Gray got asked to raise another battalion, and they raised the 248th. Most recently, at, we were in, in Belgium. I got to lay the wreath for the... Uh, 248th at the Men and Gate, which is uh, one of those uh, bucket list things. I've never thought I'd ever get to do that. So this is what a battalion in World War I looks like. This is the 157th. So that's Collingwood right there, A Company. 1100. So there's four of these battalions raised between the two counties. Can you imagine what the population was of Simcoe County in 1915? Well, that big, right? Ten percent of them don't come home. Now we went crazy over 14 years with 158 killed in Afghanistan. Can you imagine all the letters coming home, telegrams constantly to Collingwood and Barrie and Midland and Aurelia from these two battalions raised in the county? A phenomenal contribution. It's about one percent of the national total. This is what I'm trying to find. If anyone can tell me where this was in Clarksburg, you win a prize. That's the Clarksburg Armory, and I think it's a woods now, but I can't find it, any sign of it. But in 1966, it was there because there's a plaque down on the Beaver River in the park that says the band of the, Reg uh, the Grand Simple Foresters formed up for the centennial of Clarksburg at the Armory, so they marched down the main drag. Okay, that was the first time I learned of it. I did an internet search and I've now found four pictures of the Clarksburg Armory, but I have no idea where that is in Clarksburg. World War II, we start off as infantry, but then become the 26th Army Tank Regiment. And that's what we go overseas. The first battalion of the Grand Simcoe's that went overseas was a tank regiment. The second battalion stayed here in Canada for the duration. They did home defense and it was infantry. But interesting if they 
two of them had gone overseas together and actually fought together to have a, an armored unit and an infantry unit both wearing the same hat that so it was really unusual. But that didn't happen. So here we go. The 1st Battalion was mobilized in June of 1940 and finally embarked for overseas in 1943. and served in Meaford, Borden, down in DeBert, Nova Scotia, and probably a couple other places before it finally got to go overseas. It was converted from infantry to armor, and as I mentioned, became the 26th Army Tank Regiment and was assigned to the original 2nd Canadian Armor Brigade. This is important because you can get confused. The 3rd Canadian Armor Brigade became the 2nd and the 2nd was disbanded. So when you're reading history books, you can wonder, like, where did these people come from? Well, they changed names and uh, it's very confusing. The 2nd Battalion remained here. Okay, here's what we've done since the Second World War in peacekeeping. So it's, this is peacekeeping and peace making. <coughs> so we did the last part of the Cyprus rotation. Cyprus was probably the last in the Middle East, the last of the true peacekeeping, Chapter 6 of the UN Charter. After that, things have got nasty, and I don't believe in true peacekeeping, or the old definition of peacekeeping anymore, had died with Bosnia. I served in Bosnia. We tried to go in there with Chapter 6 rules, and it was a disaster. The UN mission was a total failure, and finally with the uh, Dayton Accord, it was handed over to NATO, and we solved that problem. But there's a the number of foresters that served on these missions. And then more recently, we've been in Sierra Leone. In fact, two of the commanders of the Sierra Leone mission were SEALs from the Grand Central. So uh, Shane McCarthy, who just stepped down, he commanded in Sierra Leone, and so did uh, Bill Adcock before him. And it's funny, Bill turned 60 over there, and they had to send him home because he, he maxed out his age. So uh, they, he, he turned into a pumpkin, and they had to send him home. And then in Afghanistan, there were 54, and they all made it home. We didn't lose one. A few of them uh, got hurt, but not too badly. Some have been scarred mentally, though, from the experience. NATO deployments, so during the Cold War, we were in Germany during major exercises, and the same with Norway, and then of course with the Bosnian War, after those foresters that went with the UN, uh, after the Dayton Accord in 1995, yeah, 95, it switched to NATO. And then most recently with Afghanistan. And we've had some over in the Ukraine already. So working out of Poland for the whole thing that's going on, it's very quiet in the news. Mm -hmm. But there's already been foresters over and back. So I don't know there's I think there's more probably coming up. Natural disasters. Well, first one that stands out was Hurricane Hazel in 1954. This was a Friday night. On the way home, I was working in Toronto and I got up and I spent the next 36 hours doing uh, uh, emergency relief from the Barry tornado. That was pretty wild. And then we got asked for volunteers for the Red River floods, which we sent out. And then we sent a platoon and it ended up in Smith Falls during the big ice storm in 97. Uh, and in more recent years, we've been asked like the Kelowna fires and now we've had folks on standby. But uh, no one went, but we were ready to go. So here's what we've done uh, this year. And I'll uh, just go through some of these. So we started off on this, and now Rogers has taken this over. So Theatre by the Bay in Barrie actually did a play all summer on the 157th and Life at Home. It was fantastic. They went back to original letters and diaries and told the story of real people from the community uh, going over, being killed, uh, what happened at home you know, with the families, uh, uh, the whole thing with uh, uh, making clothing at home to, to ship over. There's a lot of knitting went on in World War One because what the troops wanted was socks, believe it or not, and that was uh, really, really important. Um, the other thing uh, we're doing is, uh, when this is all finished, it will go into the local schools, libraries, and you guys will get a copy. And uh, Rogers wants to make a six-part TV series on the history of the Great Circle, so we've started filming already. I brought some of these, a new concise history, I've got 25 of them, so uh, if you want one, uh, they're up here, I'll put them out at the end. 
Presentation of new cars. I've got some pictures to show you. This is a huge event. The next one won't be probably till 2066. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be pushing up the daisies by then. So it was a good thing I was on the early one, the, the first one in 78. So to see two of my lifetime, both of them in uniform with the same regiment, pretty outstanding. And then we did the Freedom of the City with Base Borden on this 4th of June. So the Governor General was in Owen Sound on the 20th of May, and then he was. Uh, then we're back again for Borden on the 4th of June. Now this is not correct. This was the original plan, but I did forgot to change the slide. Um, the memorial at Borden was the sacred soil from Vimy that we brought back last year. And I played the part of Private Webster at Vimy last year, and uh, with the soil, uh, thanks to Jamie Massey. And uh, Borden had a World War One uniform made for me, and uh, we went over to Vimy. And the fellow I played, uh, Webster, was from Penetang. He's a young fellow, 24. He was shot in the face on the morning of Vimy, and uh, evacuated back to the major hospital at Etap, France, on the English coast. And he passed away four days later. So we went to his grave. We went to uh, Etap and uh, to the Commonwealth War Grave there, huge, because it was where a, cemetery, where a hospital was. And we put a, a flag on that, a Forrester flag on his grave. The base commander was there, and General uh, Malash. And uh, then uh, he became the poster boy for the whole of Borden's 100th, and was a Forrester from Panatang Machine. Mm -hmm. it, the way we found them was I got asked to find a Forrester from Vimy, and we were just doing that research. And I, I went, oh, yeah, sure, I'll find that. <laughs> Google, I found his medals online and his whole story. So, Jamie Massey bought the medals, and uh, turns out his nephew is a, now in his 90s, is a reverend down in Oshawa. So now he comes up and uh, pretty tickled that we picked his, uh, his uncle to be the poster child for the Borden 100th. So, the other thing we did was uh, the end of June, we went down to St. John's, Newfoundland and uh, met with the Colonel-in-Chief, Princess Anne, and uh, took the new colors to her. And I'll show you a picture of that. She's posed for a portrait with them. Um, as was mentioned in my intro, I deal with the palace, in fact, today. Um, I talk very regularly with uh, Princess Anne's office. It's, uh, I kind of like that. They get right back to me like that. And the private secretary wasn't even in the palace. He's in Malaysia. And got back to me just like that today. So. Um, I've been twice to the palace to see Princess Anne at her invitation, private audiences, so it's, it's kind of neat. The interesting part, I'll give you a little aside, the inside of Buckingham Palace is as beautiful as you think. It's like the Louvre in the hallway. The offices look like the Barry Armory. <laughs> <laughs> they are just working. It looks like a, a military barracks inside. It's just people with wooden desks and files up to here working away. It's just the hallways look like a museum. The rest is a hard working place. So. And here's goes back to lest we forget. One of our projects for 2016 for the sesquicentennial was to figure out our war debt. Why would this be a problem? Well, South Africa, we thought was a piece of cake, but we just found another one. World War II, we thought was done, only to find out one guy we chased for a long time trying to find his records that was supposedly killed in action on the 8th of August 1944 with the British Columbia Dragoons. Actually came home, lived a great life in the Elk Lake Legion, and died quite happily as a very old man. He wasn't killed in action at all. So we couldn't believe anything. And World War I was a nightmare. And the reason being was those four battalions, all of them, the 36 that were raised at board in 1916 that went over, and those four were part of that, were all broken up for reinforcements once they got to England. So they went into theater, into France, to reinforce other battalions already in the field. So when it came to records of war dead after the war, they had been all helter-skelter all over the place. So it was very difficult to figure out how many of the Grays and Simcoe's were actually killed from those four battalions in the First World War. Well, a book was published about 15 years ago called C.F. Roll of Honor. It's about that thick. We bought a copy of it, and Lauren Williams, who used to be the regimental sergeant major back in the 70s, Lauren's in his 80s now and still going strong. Lauren got up every morning at about 
five o'clock, I think, sat down and went through that book line by line in the type and it's about that big, it's really small. And it's name, rank, serial number, home battalion, battalion killed with and all that. He went through and he cross-referenced it all. He went through that book five times, pulled out all the names, then we cross-referenced it with Commonwealth War Graves, National Archives, the Books of Remembrance in the Peace Tower, and if everything didn't match, it all had to match, then we accepted them for the Roll of Honor. The Roll of Honor is now done, and there's two of them done. They're hanging in the uh, Barry and Old Sound Armory, so there are big panels on the wall, and there's room to add a fourth, which we're going to call the addendum, because we just found another one, the one from South Africa. His name will go in there. But there's over 570 names on that board. And the ones from World War I, lest we forget, we forgot them. We didn't even know who they were. Mm -hmm. We do know who they are now. And uh, last year I got to, with when we went over for the Vimy soil, the 13 that died at Vimy, we put flags on the, those that had graves. So we're starting to do it. This last trip we just did, we did the World War II ones and uh, visited the foresters that died at D-Day, the ones shortly thereafter in the uh, uh, fillet gap. And then the ones at Bergenop Zoom from the Battle of the Shell, we visited their graves. Some of them, I think, especially the ones uh, last year from the First World War, might have been the first people to visit them in the entire time they've been there. So it would have been so difficult uh, for family to get over there after the First World War. So we've actually done that, and kudos to Lauren Williams. I don't know how he isn't blind from her suffering from, uh, I don't know, what's it called, myopia or whatever, from looking at those little tiny print, but he figured it out. And he's done a marvelous job. And then what we just got back from, we did a battlefield tour. Uh, we went to northern France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. So we did places like Vimy Ridge, uh, Dieppe, uh, Caen, the Normandy beaches, Ypres, uh, Amiens, and right up to the last 100 days of the war. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the numbers. Pretty substantial losses. 457 letters and telegrams came back from the two counties in World War One. Tiny population. Okay, the new colors. Well, they were presented on the 20th of May. It was supposed to be the 21st, and they were consecrated by the Chaplain General. And then we took them, of course, down to see the Princess. So here's what the old colors look like. This is Princess Anne. This is. Us on parade in Toronto, she's doing the official opening of Queen's Key. So there's the Queen's collar and the regimental collar, and she says she bows her head as she goes past them. Only infantry battalions carry collars, they're not flags. They are the most prized possession, and they're only presented by royalty. They belong to Her Majesty forever. They're consecrated by the Chaplain General. They have a lifespan in the old days, normally 25 to 30 years. That's just been up to 50 years. And so the set that we had presented in 1978 turned 38 years old this year and we're falling apart. So there's Princess Anne and Barry in 2013 and inspecting our Royal Guard of Honor and uh, the Queen's color and the Regimental color. So these are now going to be laid up, and they're going in St. George's Anglican Church in Owen Sound. That'll be in probably in May of next year. So that's what they look like. Now, we're going to talk about colors and colors. So color with a capital C is that. Color with a small c is the shade. They're the wrong shade of green, and they have been for 38 years, and girl was crazy. Okay, they're supposed to be Lincoln Green. I don't know what that is, but that's not Lincoln Green. So we, we were really, really looking forward to, as much as we love those, to lay them up. And uh, so there's Princess Anne posing with them. This picture was taken by one of the photographers at Base Borden. His boss thought it was the finest portrait, it was Mike Rick, finest portrait he'd ever seen, and the palace is using that on their website. So originally the colors had 
Th that's all the battle honors. So you'll notice we've got Northwest Canada in 1885. We have all these from the First World War, and this is what our, our tour was this last month. In fact, the, the last day we went from Amiens back up to Arras and did those three. We didn't get to Afghanistan, though. That's a bit too far for the bus. But, uh, you'll notice, though, there's a big gap in here. It's called World War II. And that's because, once again, we got broken up for reinforcements. That's what happened to the 26th Army Tank Regiment. Because the original 2nd Army Armored Brigade got broken up. And uh, so we didn't get any battle honors because they, they changed the rules. So we're really annoyed about that. We think there should be two. We, Northwest Canada, sorry, Northwest Europe, 44-45. And Italy, 43-45. If they gave, Ottawa gave us those, we'd be happy. So I haven't given up on it yet. You'll see there's a huge gap in history there. So here we go. This is Owen Sound on the 20th of May this past, this year. And this is the Chaplain General, Guy Chapdelaine. He was one of my students when I was on staff at the Canadian Forces College. That's our padre. That's uh, Reverend Canon David Warren, Major from Barrie. There's the Governor General. And Major uh, uh, Phil Brown, who's also the OPSO of the OPP here in Collingwood. And... Uh, He's a major in the, in the regiment. And you'll just see sticking behind there is the CO of the day, which is Shane MacArthur from Wallen Sound. He's now the deputy commander of 31 Brigade. So what's happening here? The drums, the regimental drums, have been laid in a drum head altar. And as I tease the audience, there's only two times that's made. One is to consecrate colors, the other time is court-martial. So fortunately, it wasn't my court-martial that day. And Phil is laying the regimental color on top of the drums, and then a uh, major British officer now, the CO, Perry, he uh, laid the Queen's color over top. So they're crossed like this over the drum head, and then the Chaplain General consecrates them. And at that point, they're official colors and must be guarded at all times. That looks like the right green. It is the right green. Now, <laughs> why is it the right green? Well, because I went to the Sherwood Foresters and said, who makes your colors? Hobsons and Sons in London. I got a hold of Hobsons and Sons. And I begged and pleaded and cried and wailed till they sent me a swatch of the material, which they did. And then the uh, federal government, their textile people, they bought enough of it to keep us going for a while. So it's in storage in Ottawa. And that's the real McCoy. That's the stuff from that's Lincoln Green. And so here's Princess Anne with the new color, so the new Queen's color, the new regimental color, which has the battle honor for Afghanistan on it, and the battle of Hill 70, which was missing from World War I, on the other colors for some strange reason. And this is in Government House in Newfoundland. This is in St. John, Newfoundland, on the 30th of June this year. So Princess Anne, and it was interesting, um, I wanted to see if she would pose with all of us that, that went down to St. John's. So we asked the staff at, at Government House, and they went, oh, I don't think she'll do that. You know, well, you know they were all, oh, that sounds pretty weird. So anyway, the private secretary that I deal with, one who was emailing today, Nick Wright, Captain Wright, he comes in, and we haven't seen each other for a long time personally. It's always been phone calls and mail. So I said, uh, do you think she'd pose with all of us, with the callers? And he turned to me and said, John, she'll do whatever you ask her. Got it. So <laughs> we did the picture, and she's, she's fabulous. So here's our trip. How are we doing for time here? Are we all right? Yeah. Okay. So we started off in Paris, and we went. We did things backwards. We did it in the order that the bus could do it. So we went from Paris to Falaise. Now, if you remember, at the D-Day landings, the Canadians landed at Juno Beach at Caen, and they fought their way inland. The Battle of Caen was brutal. They finally broke out, and the whole idea was to trap the Germans in the fillet pocket here. So you got the British and the Canadians coming this way, and the Americans coming this way. And Canada has always been accused of being the weak sister in this whole thing, and closing the gap. History has proven that to be not true. It was one wicked battle. So we stopped at a, the Canadian Cemetery at breakfast sur Lays and uh, laid a wreath visited all the foresters that are buried there, including Darcy Murray, who's one of our retired sergeant majors and very much a historian with their unit, his uncle. So I've got a nice picture of, of um, Darcy with his uncle. 
The interesting part is Darcy has aged more than me because we went to school together, and now he looks like Colonel O'Brien. So at the Simcoe County Museum, they tease him that he's really Colonel O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> You get a chance to meet Darcy because he talks a lot about the Northwest Rebellion. Uh, he's an excellent speaker on that. So then we said uh, two nights in Con. We went from there over to Dieppe. Now the Foresters weren't at Dieppe. That's 1942. That's way before we got there. However, how can you be a Canadian and not go to Dieppe? Right. So we went to Dieppe. And uh, that was just insane. I've been there many times, so I was interested to hear what my colleagues thought of it when they actually saw it and they thought the whole thing was absolute insanity to attack the app. And uh, it's a little wonder that uh, we took a shellacking there. And then we went from there uh, via Bruges to Antwerp. And then we took a day trip and went in, into the Netherlands to Bergen op Zoom. This is the Scheldt estuary that Canada was tasked with liberating in 1944-45, uh, so that the, the port at Rotterdam, and uh, let's see the other one, there's two ports there, I guess the one at Antwerp, were, were clear, because all the stuff was coming overland from the Normandy beaches. It was way too much logistically to try to, to fight the Germans and keep the supply chain going. It was just crazy, the distance. So this was a wicked, wicked fight in very bad weather, and there were three foresters buried at Bergen op Zoom in the Commonwealth grave there. So we, uh, we visited them and put uh, a wreath on the, at the same time. Then we went from there to Eat. So now we're going backwards in time. We're back into the First World War. That's the Battle of Passchendaele. And that's where we won our first Victoria Cross. First and only. And that was Tommy Holmes out of Owen Sound. He was 147th grade. Youngest Canadian to win the Victoria Cross. He was 19. He just turned 19. Then the next day, we had a really busy day. We went from Eeps. Amiens, but we went via Hill 70, Vimy, Beaumont Hamel, and then uh, where the Royal Newfoundland Regiment got wiped out, and, uh, and then down to Amiens. We stayed overnight in Amiens, and then the next day the bus driver thought we were insane until we explained why we were doing it. We went all the way back up to Arras, which is Vimy, and then we went towards Cambrai. And that's the last 100 days of the war. So just outside of Arras, that's where my paternal grandmother's first husband, Edgar, was killed. He was blown to pieces. Father of two, my two eldest aunts. And uh, he almost made it. So anyway, we did the last 100 days, and we finished up at uh, Burlong Wood. And all along the way, there's Canadian memorials we stopped and later read and took pictures. Then we went down to Paris, and then the rest of that's top secret. Because <laughs> they had nothing to do with the regiment. We had a great time. We did. We had a great time. <laughs> and I think that is all my blabbing. And the rest is uh, questions. What is the purpose of defending the Arctic? The Arctic is one of the things of sovereignty. So our big fear, because now that uh, with global warming, what used to be you couldn't get there from here, you now can get there. And there are people going into the Arctic that we don't want in the Arctic. Like who? Uh, well, the Russians have got cruise ships going through the Arctic. Right? We have, a, we have a contested thing with the Americans. We agreed to disagree. And that is, they, they think the Northwest Passage is international waters. We say it's an inland waterway. The reason there's an argument over that is because of other straits in other parts of the world, especially in the Middle East, whereas if they admit that that's an inland waterway, they have to admit these other maritime disputed straits are actually inland waterways. Right? So it's nudge, nudge, wink, wink, we agree to disagree. But you remember when the Manhattan went through back in, I think, in the 70s? And it was held to pay for that because they didn't liaise with the Canadian government about taking an oil tanker through the very sensitive Arctic, which was even more sensitive then because of the, the just the state of the uh, weather. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the reasons. There's lots of resources in the Arctic. There's diamonds. There's oil. Uh, you know, the Chinese are looking at it. So I don't know whether it's real or imagined on our part to defend it. Um, I remember the, one of the former chiefs of the defense staff used to 
laughed and say the first thing the Canadian forces would be doing if another country went into the Arctic was a search and rescue mission. It's, even now, it's extremely difficult, hostile environment to work in, even in the summertime. Because the weather can change in a heartbeat and uh, you can freeze to death. Just wondering what year did you go from uh, the Armored Corps to infantry? Oh, uh, the second time? So. 72, 72? Yeah, 70 on the nose. 70, okay. Yeah. So, uh, we've had this on again, off again relationship with the Armored Corps. So, in, in 42, we became armored until, that was the first battalion until the end of the war, but it was disbanded in England. So the current regiment actually descends, if you're looking at a family tree, from the 2nd Battalion. And uh, it, it was infantry at the end of the war and then became an anti-tank regiment as part of the Royal Canadian Artillery until 1946. And then, uh, sorry, that's wrong, it started in 46 until 1954. And then the regiment became armored again. So that period from 54 to 70, it was armored. So when I first joined, we were just losing the tanks, and we had Sherman tanks. And then uh, it's been infantry ever since. I mentioned that you saw the colors. The Queen had approved in 1968 an armored guidon. It's like a swallowtail flag, for the lack of a better word. It's the, it's the cavalry equivalent of our infantry colors except there's only one of them. There isn't a kings and a queens, there's just one. And uh, while she approved it in 1968, because the regiment went infantry in 70, it was never produced. And so one of the things I didn't have on the slide was as part of our, our uh, 150th, we're having it produced. It's officially a replica, because it won't be consecrated, and it's going in the museum. But we'll actually have the gate on for everyone to see. And it'll be ready in a couple of weeks. So it's going to be presented to the troops at their Christmas dinner. And uh, it's being made by the same company that made the current uh, colors and made the ones that are actually in the uh, Owen Sound uh, County office from uh, years gone by. Some of the gray ones are in the county building in uh, Owen Sound. But that, that's when we went back to the infantry. You know, Dr. Sheehan, company that uh, went into the Niagara was considered part of the Curry Central Force? Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, it would have been part of the 35th or leading up to the 35th. What, what happened was uh, in the early 1800s, uh, right through to basically 1866, most communities had their own uh, uh, either rifle company or, or cavalry squadron or uh, infantry company, and they were gazetted into battalions by county. That's where we end up in the 35th and, uh, and the 31st for Gray County. So that would be militia in 1900. Well, it was all militia. It was yeah. militia right until now. We've gotten rid of the word militia uh, because it's really become a professional reserve army. Uh, but yeah, a citizen army, and it, it still very much is. I guess I have to ask you, what do they get a month now? Back then it was fifteen dollars. What do the guys get? Now? They actually make a pretty good wage and now. They make pretty good yeah. Wage now. Yeah. <laughs> we make in peacetime in Canada, we make eighty-five percent of the regular force wage. Okay? If we deploy overseas, it's hundred percent. And believe it or not, that's what they did in 19, 1899 for South Africa. Mm -hmm. When they signed up and went, they got full British Army wages. When they came home, they went back to be a militia. Anyway, I, are there any women? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And we encourage everybody to join that wants to join. So uh, we don't have a lot of women because it's an infantry unit. Uh, the ones that are all the brains, though, that make it actually run, they're all women. It's, it's the order run. <laughs> but don't tell the guys I said that. But if they like to be paid, it's true. Uh, so yeah, it's. Uh, and there's no restriction now, it hasn't been for well, probably 20 years now in the Canadian Forces uh, for combat roles for women. There used to be a restriction, it was only combat support, now it's wide open, even submarines now. If you want to do that. Okay, I think I'm getting the hook, so thank you very much. <laughs>